So we're going to get started now. Um, so today is our seventh session where we'll, um, we'll be filing, uh, learning from Mr. Tran about filing your patent um, and like successes and failures with patents. So Mr. Tran, he's been, um, he's a patent lawyer and he's been working for 20 years and um, he did the Invisalign patent which uh, many of you are familiar with and now he works with different startups in Silicon Valley. So I'd also like to, um, before we get started, I'd like to announce our second annual Silicon Valley Tech Day, which is on June 11th. And this is in the Seven Trees Community Center in San Jose. And it's um, 1.30 to 5 p.m. And it's just an opportunity for all of you guys to hear from the industry leaders and Silicon Valley executives uh, about upcoming technology trends and um, hear innovative business plans. So we'll have four panels this year. Last year we had three. So um, we have, same as last year, the industry executives panel, the women in technology panel, and uh, the young entrepreneurs panel. I mean, uh, the Silicon Valley Local Leaders panel. And then this year, we're going to be adding the young entrepreneurs panel, where all of you guys will have teams and will be presenting um, to, to this panel your ideas. So um, the grand final will be the Startup Pitch Fest, and um, you'll be pitching in front of a panel of VCs with a chance to win $1,000 and perhaps VC funding. So um, all, uh, all the RSVPs are at tinyurl.com slash Silicon Valley Tech Day. So now uh, we'll get started. Um, kind of hard to read, but this is just an overview of the first three weeks. The first week we learned passion, creativity, problems. Second week was leadership, hard work. And then uh, third week we had the VC and the business plan. And then the fourth through sixth week we had week four with um, incorporation, and then week five with profit, sales, and cost, week six, um, customer research. All right, thanks. Well, well I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I think I uh, spent uh, a lot of efforts that adults themselves uh, had trouble in handling. So, uh, congratulations, you've done uh, well. So, how many of you here have uh, heard of intellectual property? Can somebody describe it? What, is, what do you think it is? So it's basically like a patent or some type of document that prevents somebody else from taking your idea. So you're basically putting, it's, you're filing a patent with the USPTO saying that nobody else can steal their idea and you basically have the rights to sell that idea. Excellent, excellent. So, um, uh, let me kind of transition to the slide here. So, in traditionally, companies have been very, um, you know, back in the early 19th century, 18th, 19th century, they're very uh, uh, machine uh, intensive, and so equipment intensive, right? But, uh, the, the, you know, as we move and we, we develop more knowledge and, and, and the products are now depending on your, um, your skills, for example, like I say, an Apple, a very small, the, the, man, the ability to manufacture the product, you know, the, the value that has come down relative to the value of the, the knowledge capital. So that's what this chart tells you, is that over time, the, the value of knowledge has increased. And that value of knowledge is captured in what we call intellectual property. Next slide, please. So, uh, from 1982 to 2000, you can see that the percentage, well I guess the color didn't come out, but you'll see that basically the intangible assets, your patent, your copyright value, has increased over the physical plants and equipment that you have. Next slide, please. So for example, we take an example of Gillette, so that's the razor company, right? Uh, the value of that intellectual property is actually in the 76%, whereas the manufacturing plant is about only you know, uh, 25%. So that tells you the, the, the importance of intellectual property. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so many, the reason many entrepreneurs ignore um, the IP system is that they think it's expensive, they think it takes so long, and, and it's something that you shouldn't even bother to deal with it, just you know, deal with the customers, uh, uh, you know, get the product to the market first. Uh, and uh, sometimes that could be uh, not productive. Uh, so let's go to the next one. So innovation can be very expensive, right? You guys spent uh, these four or five weeks now trying to design 
your product, right? Uh, and, and you wouldn't want somebody else to just kind of take the same idea and, and run with that. And so that's one reason before you even talk to investors uh, and everybody else is you uh, protect your concept first. And um, so let's next, next slide. So here's the typical uh, innovation process. Let me just go over here so I can read it better. So first you do your R&D. Uh, and that, I think you've been spending the past three or four, uh, probably month, kind of finalizing the concept of your product, your software. Uh, and then you go through all these complicated uh, upscaling, testing of your software. Uh, then you worry about how that's going to be distributed. So in, in the case of software, you really don't have a production issue. You just have server. You probably load them up to your Amazon, or you can have your own servers that deliver. So production is really not an issue for software. And then you have to go to marketing, which is, uh, I think, what you've been working on for the past, uh, I, I assume, a couple of sessions, is marketing, right? And there you learn what are the important things that customers value, and that's where you fix and you, you, uh, you focus your time on that. And so you definitely want to have that investment in time protected so that people can't just simply learn from what you do uh, and then uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, rapidly uh, clone what you've done. So next slide, please. So again, this is more of a new product development, uh, which I think you've been living and breathing through it in the past month. Idea generation, so you screen your idea, you test your, product, your concept with uh, the customers, uh, you do a market analysis to see if this market is big enough for your product. Uh, you know, if it's big, then investors might want to invest, and if it's small, they may, yeah, you know, it may be a good business, but it might not be a venture fundable business. Then you do your beta testing and your customer testing and more your market testing, right? And uh, and then finalize use bump chip. So that's kind of uh, the things that a summary of what you've been going through in the past month. Next slide, please. And the IP system adds value at every single stage of that uh, new business development that you're doing. So for example, before you um, uh, talk to anybody, customers, investors, uh, your friends, what do you do first is you protect them with a, uh, with a patent application first. So we are in what is called a first-to-file system, that means that Let's say if um, you and let's say somebody from next block were working on the same concept, let's assume that let's say um, you, uh, 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 you file your application, um, let's say today, and the person who's been working for a year from now, a year ago, and let's say they file it, uh, let's say next month. So under the first to file system, what do you think is going to happen? Who's going to win? <coughs> that's, that's the name implies. You've got to file first. So that's, that's why it's very important that at the very beginning of every venture, you should do a filing first because the, you know, the, the one who gets in the door first counts. It's not the one who came up with the idea first but sat on it for so long. So the patents come in in the first stage. Um, so there are certain businesses that have technology like software, the patent system will work there, uh, although there's some trick to maneuvering it, but, but in general, um, you, can, you can get patents for the software. Uh, and if you're, let's say if your business, if you're a musician, your business is, uh, you, you create a musical um, um, you know, recordings or videos, that would be a copyright domain. Okay, and then once you, <coughs> Come up with a concept, you need to fundraise, right? You need to talk to investors. And I think that's next week's session. That's the next session. Now, typically in, the, in Silicon Valley, investors don't sign confidentiality agreements. And so for you to be able to talk frankly with an investor and show them what you plan to do to get funding, then you can protect yourself. So the patent, if you do file a patent already, then you're already protected, so that's great. Then as you go through your product design, you're going to have multiple, multiple iterations, right? Uh, you're going to go and test this out with uh, your customer, and your customer might say, well, I don't like this feature. I should be done this way. So you're going to have to change and adjust and iterate. They call it iteration, or sometimes they call it pivoting. Um, so every single time you pivot, you should consider, is this a 
significant pivot, then you should file some additional protection on it. Uh, and then as you go to commercialization and, mar and marketing, this is where you, all your investment up, uh, at the beginning will pay off. Because when you commercialize it, then you have value in having being the only one with the product. And uh, so uh, that's one entry, is that if you're successful, then your product is protected. So, so for example, Apple uh, tried to block Samsung from entering the phone market, and vice versa. Samsung says, I have my own IP, Apple infringe it, and therefore they try to, it's a tug of war in that scenario, right? So that's one, one scenario is that you actually have a product. The other scenario, which is actually quite common also, is many companies don't make it into the marketplace. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen the statistics where nine out of 10 startups actually fail. And I hope a lot of those companies, you can see that statistic bear out. What happens when you fail is that all your investment in, in, in the software becomes uh, not, not very valuable, but you could sell the intellectual property. So I'll give you an example. One company that raised $15 million in a chip design, very expensive chip. They spent, you know, $14.9 million on the chip design and maybe a couple hundred thousand on the patents that they did. And in the next round, they couldn't get funding. And the chip that's, you know, a couple of years out, it became stale and nobody cares about it, right? So, but that hundred thousand they put in there got them $5 million for, 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 for the Sell. So the investors recoup some of that money. That's, that's, that's an example of how you, you use the patent system to uh, enhance your business model. Next slide, please. So uh, the, I guess the colors didn't come out yet, but the intellectual property system now has, it's not just patents. I mean, this is what you came to hear, but it includes patents, trademark, trade secrets, and copyrights. So uh, trade patents and copyrights, I've talked about already briefly, right? Um, who can tell me uh, what is a trademark? Is that a phrase that somebody has, like copyright kind of? Uh, exactly. So if I were to say I'm buying an Apple computer, what, what is the, the trademark there? Macintosh. Apple. Well, Macintosh is also a type, yeah. Uh, so. So a trademark is a term that modifies a, um, uh, a noun. So for example, app, I'm buying an Apple computer. I'm buying a Samsung phone, right? But if I, if I told you, oh, I'm just buying an apple as a fruit, that is not protected because, you know, apple uh, being a fruit is a descriptive term. And, and, and the trademark system, you're not allowed to just simply trademark a common term, you know, I, I can't trademark piano to block the piano with people from saying piano. But I can say, uh, uh, you know, I can trademark a piano phone, for example. That would be different, right? Who's familiar with Xerox? All right, so what do you think Xerox is? Is that a, what is that, is that a, what is it? Is that a trademark, a copyright, a patent, or what is that? Uh, it's actually a trademark. <laughs> because it identifies a vendor of copying equipment. Now, trademark, if you don't use it correctly, it can, you can lose your trademark right. Because if you use it as a noun, then all of a sudden you're becoming, it's almost like I'm saying, uh, I'm, well, I'm playing music on a piano, and that piano is a noun, right? So, at one point in the, pa in the past, a few years ago, Xerox was in serious trouble of losing the trademark to Xerox, because they say, oh, I'm making a Xerox. So they had to tell people to say, oh, you're making a Xerox copy. Okay? So that is the, you know, that is the significance of Xerox. So for example, I'm buying an Apple phone or an iPhone. Well, I guess it's kind of iPhone the way they're using it. It's kind of borderline. But I'm using an iPhone phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go on. Uh, OK, uh, oh, well, let me see. Trade secret. I, I have an address that. All right, who knows what a trade secret is? You yeah, can guess. Come on, what is the trade secret? All right. It's something that they add, it's, it's something that they do that the like the speciality. Correct, correct. So in order to keep a secret, you have to make efforts at keeping it secret. So you have to 
uh, put on your document, for example, you may have seen in some of your business plans. I don't, I'm not sure if the other uh, uh, speakers have said you should put a con confidential in, in your business plan or something like that. So that's an attempt to keep the thing secret, right? So, but, but if you uh, attempt, have a good faith attempt to keep something secret and let's say somebody else improperly um, uh, release that secret out, then you can you can make a claim against that. So, for example, if there are spies uh, in your company that took your information that you kept as a secret and then bring it out to another company and use it, then you can pursue the other company for violating your trade secret. But before you enforce that, you got to show that it is a secret and then you made efforts to protect it. So that's a trade secret. All right, next one, please. Next slide. So, okay, uh, yes, we have just gone over the same thing. So, for example, um, uh, can a, an icon be a trademark? Can a, a symbol be a trademark? Give me an example. The swoosh sign, right? Well, how, how about a sound? Like, uh, like, let's say it's a musical sound. Could that be a trademark? Give me an example. Sorry? <laughs> Uh, oh, okay, well, that could be. I'm not familiar with that one, but you, see, you can, you've heard, yeah, I think we all have heard about it, the NBC, ding, ding, ding. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is very distinctive. Oh, yeah, right. Gecko. What is the, okay, what's the sound of Gecko? Oh, well, that was fun. So it is a trademark, but it's not a sound mark. McDonald's, McDonald's a little bit, right? So yeah, the power up of a phone could be a trademark, right? So those are all trademarks, yes. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. If it identifies the source, then, then that could serve as a trademark. Alright, let's go on to the next slide. Ah. Um, could a, a model be a trademark? Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've seen it, right? And uh, the Magano and the Swoosh, so the brand. So that's right. So all these companies, you know this, the value is in the, the branding, not in the manufacturing. Most of these companies, they actually, they, they, they outsource the production to, you know, I guess China and where, elsewhere. But the value for these companies is not in the actual equipment, making the shoes or making whatever objects they sell. Apple, the, you know, I think has a very tiny faculty here. They don't manufacture the bones that they sell, right? They do rely on the intellectual property. Their value is in bulk intellectual property. Uh, all right, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, well, next slide. We've seen these already. The X, the X. Ah, okay. So this is an example of a trade secret, which I kind of summarized before. So um, in this case, uh, they they have. Uh, Fruit of Balloon has some business plans and report that their competitor apparently Topher. Uh, yeah, and and uh, so the report included production for secret information in the manufacturing plant, and uh, and their competition somehow got a hand on that. They were able to sue the competitor to block that from being uh, misused. So that's an example of a trade secret and how it's used. Next, please. Yeah. Okay. So a trade secret it can last forever. So. Um, I'm thinking of a very famous trade secret that you know many many people drink. Can you guess? Coke. Oh, it's already in there. All right, Coke. It's over I think a hundred years, and nobody has been able to crack the secret. It is a well-known trade. Well, it's a trade secret that everybody knows, of, but they just you know, couldn't figure out how to handle it. Next one, please. So copyright. Copyright is basically, you know, when you apply for copyright, you have the right to, to um, the composition that you write and things like that. So, you know, the musicians rely on that. Let's say Hollywood, they rely very significantly on copyright. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, who else do you think might rely on copyright? If, if they rely on a lot of writing. Yes, both publishers, absolutely. So, uh, yes. Absolutely, yeah, the website, you'll see the copy, so copyright signs all you know, underneath it, right? It's a standard thing, yes. Absolutely, those are all work, you know, that, that you create. Yeah, they're all copyrighted, yes. Writers? Oh, drawing, oh yeah, yeah, drawing, absolutely, yes. 
Photos, absolutely. So there are many, many things that are protected under copyright. So when you do your user interface, that also is a copyright of whatever, right? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. You, as a photographer, protect people from simply taking pictures of your picture and then redistributing it, right? All right, next, please. So, yeah, these are just, you know, uh, it, it, copyright can, yeah, like, I think you, you guys have actually recognized most of this already. Broadcasting right, distribution, uh, designs, uh, drawings, uh, derivative work. You can even copyright your, der your derivative work. So, for example, if you compile uh, a bunch of sources together, that is a copyrightable uh, work. All right, next. Yep, we just went over this. Both forms, sculptures, no one mentioned sculptures, dolls, um, yeah, um, you know, dance steps, architectural work, motion. So yeah, we, we, we've discussed this. So let's go to the next one, please. So patents, let's go to next, a concrete example of a patent. Uh, so patents are, you know, they, 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 they uh, it covers function, functional, uh, devices. So in this example, this is the patent that covers the uh, Coke uh, um, opening, um, the, uh, uh, the pull ring, right? And uh, so this guy collects uh, a tenth of a penny per can, and there's a lot of cans being made, so he's, he's done quite well. Yes? Well, if they if they use it exactly the way that he's covered in his patent, then my answer, my guess is, yeah, they have to pay for it. And I assume that the one who's going to be collecting the, I'm not familiar with the uh, the, the, the way to distribute these things, but I assume that the can manufacturer, right, whoever who makes the cans, uh, needs to pay into that person. Uh, and then you know, you uh, when you distribute the can, when you buy that can from the can manufacturer, that is reflected in the cost you buy already. So of course, you know, uh, enforcing a patent in itself is a complicated thing. And so whether or not the patent covers, you know, a third party design, you got to litigate that. And it's a, it's a rather complicated thing. But my assumption is that this patent is probably very broad and it covers any kind of pull ring. Uh, because if you see that in, in the report, it says he's, selling, he's, he's getting a half of a penny. That means he's making it very inexpensive so that probably everybody is paying into the pot because it's not an expensive to pay rather than going through litigation. Yes? So after you file a patent, is there like, is like a period of time where you lose um... The life of the patent? Yeah. Is that your reference? Yeah. Uh, in life of a is 20 years from filing. Uh, so the whole intention of the patent system is that in exchange for that exclusivity, you need to teach the world how to use that invention so that that way it's a mechanism so that people can improve on each other's design. So that's a public policy behind the patent system. So can you file it again? Uh, well, the problem is that once you file it, it eventually it becomes published, right? It's on the internet. So that application would block your own future application, right? So you can really do it only once. Because your own, they call it your own work becomes, they call it prior art, and they use that against your future application, right? So you, you can do it only once, because once it's published, then that they can say, oh, well, your new claim is obvious because of your prior publication here. So, so the patent means like, it doesn't, there's no like money value The patent doesn't have what? No, like, when it's still valid, it's still worth, like, money. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah you have a patent on that, right? So it loses its validity, it, it loses all the value of its money? No, no, if you file it, right, let's say you, you file it now, uh, and that goes to, let's say, in two years, let's assume that it's, uh, the patent office says, yeah, this thing is novel, and, and I grant you a patent, right? So that patent has 20-year lifetime, uh, 20-year lifespan, right? Mm -hmm. And, and in your scenario, let's say next year, you're going to try to refile exactly the same thing, right? So in your second application, the patent office is going to say, oh, well, your first application is either exactly the same or very similar to it, but it's obvious. 
So therefore, we're not going to grant the second application, but you know, but your first application, if it's novel, it'll go through, and you will have that one happen, right? So, all right. So, this in here, no, no questions. We can go on the next slide. Yeah, so this thing just repeated what I just said, which is patent reward disclosure rather than secrecy. So this is the opposite to a trade secret, right? You need to teach the world how your invention work. And in exchange for that, you will get 20 years of exclusivity. And at the end of that 20 year exclusivity, other people can use and learn, learn from your teaching and then continue on. So that's the public purpose behind the patent system, is to encourage people to improve the arts and sciences. But they'll give you some time to recoup your investment. That's the concept. All right, next, please. So typically, what is contained in a patent document? It's really, um, let's go, uh, I, think, well, I, said, I think there's uh, some more slides, so let's go on to the next one. Yeah, let's just keep going, so going all the way through. Yeah, so that's stop. Okay, so basically in, a, in a, a formal patent, what you have is the important part is um, the description of how your invention operates. So typically that is done in a series of flow charts. Uh, in, in your case, as a software, I, I, think, I think this is coder camp, so that's probably the only thing you're working on is software, right? So, so you have a series of flow charts that describe how your uh, software operates. Uh, and the, recently there have been some, uh, they, 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 they've kind of clamped down on software inventions. So you need to be more than just algorithm in, the, in that sense. You need to be able to say, oh, this thing changes the world in some, uh, some there's some specific technique for making uh, the world better. So I, uh, it's kind of, it's a, it's a convoluted region of discussion, but let's say if you were to simply um, patent, uh, let's say if you were the first to invent uh, the, the sort uh, algorithm, the, the bubble sorting algorithm, and you try to patent that, they will reject that as pure algorithm. However, if you take the bubble sort algorithm and then use that to, let's say, maybe uh, identify um, uh, some sort of a high, you know, improve the performance of a machine through the bubble sort, then that is considered uh, a, a tangible, a, a non-abstract invention, okay? So, because you're in the software world, I just want to note that you want to be careful about how your, your flow chart and your software description tie into a tangible use, a tangible application, rather than just simply, that, oh, I invented a sorting algorithm, or I invented, um, uh, you know, some sort of a, uh, a calculation, just an abstract calculation. So uh, they have, people have tried to uh, patent trading, like stock trading systems and, and, um, and tax computation systems and those things because they're just algorithms running inside of the computer and not affecting anything tangible. Those things have been knocked out. So, uh, I don't want to kind of muddy up the water, but in general, a patent, you need to have a description of how your, um, your, your system operates. So, detailed description there. Then, uh, so here, within the description, you'll mention the problem to be solved, the solution, uh, the drawings were appropriate, and what kind of a drawings in a software do you think uh, you, you should do? In a software kind of invention, what kind of drawings typically describe? Uh, sorry? Uh, yes, the graphics, but so maybe um, uh, the user interface, maybe the flow charts, something like that. Yes. Is it the title? Is it the title, like all the, the interface, like the titles? Yeah, that's, that's the graphical user interface, right? Yeah, the flow charts. Flow chart is important. Uh, yeah, and so those are the major parts of the drawing uh, of the uh, of the uh, of a patent application. Let's just go on to the next one, please. Wow, it's hard to read uh, this color, huh? Uh, okay, so yeah, these are the advantages of patent protection, which I think we've discussed already. But maybe I'll take the, uh, the um, uh, maybe what we should do is, is let me jump, uh, well, let, let's just go over this and I'm gonna jump and show you a real life software patent application and you'll see what, 
what are the components that go into that. But essentially, you need to just, you know, for your purpose, just describe the flow chart, just uh, provide as many detailed descriptions of how the software and the system operate, and then, you know, to the extent you affect some taint, some physical machine, or thing like that, make sure you pay attention and include that into there, because that will help your case saying that you're not, an, you're not an algorithm, just an algorithm, an abstract algorithm. That's something that we don't want to be, uh, be, be uh, grouped into there because the patent office will give you trouble for that. Uh, next slide, please. Wow, it's really hard to read here. Uh, oh, yeah, so this is a case study on, on, on uh, patent protection. And in particular, patents are very important in the medical space. Uh, like, for example, all your, your medications, a billion dollars at stake, and they're protected by patents. So in this case, um, a small company, a European company called Pliva, uh, basically um, had a, a patent on a particular drug product. And uh, in the U.S., uh, a big company called Pfizer located that and says, hey, we'd like to license that for other uses. And they paid a lot of money. So, uh, so that's the value of a patent. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, so basically this is a checklist on your IP, and I think the checklist essentially is, you know, think about your trade secret uh, rights, think about your copyright uh, things that you might want to cover, uh, think about, let's say, um, so copyright, trade secret, uh, trademark, if you're going to name your company uh, some, some uh, very interesting name, like let's say Google, you might want to think trademark that, uh, and then patents, okay, next. Uh, this is just more of that, so let's just skip that. Uh, let's go to the example at the end. Uh, yeah, so, so this is an example of the drawings that are used inside of a patent. But the text is not coming out real well. So maybe what I should do is try to, uh, to show you a, a, an actual patent application. And then I'll open up the questions. Let's see. Uh, Do we have internet here? Yeah. How do we get to the internet? Um, this one? This one? Okay. All right. So, if you don't mind holding on to this. Did I have to? It looks like it was trying to. Is there some sort of a login procedure you need to do? Uh oh. So how do you do that? Um, okay. Well, can you get the internet open running for me and see if that's any question? While we're trying to get the internet, maybe I should answer a question. Uh, anybody have a particular question? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, intellectual property. That's a short word. So the IP has four categories: trade secret, trademark, copyright, patents. Yes. Um, so, so the times of the patent, how much zero dollars? When the patent, the end of the life? Yeah. The end of life. Yeah, yeah. It's not worth anything at the end of life because anybody can, you know, can can, can use that patent free, right? So. Uh, I'm not so sure when the Coke can, uh, the, uh, the ring pull ring uh, expires, but once it expires, it may have expired. Yeah, it's fired. A lot, yeah, yeah. A lot of so that, so. yeah, yeah. So, but that's the whole point. You teach the world how your thing operates, you have your 20 years of exclusivity, and then after that, the world can use it and improve. So, it's working now? Mm -hmm. So, let's pull out a software patent. Let me see. Let's just go, uh, do a uh, 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 um, Free patent on mine. Let's say Google patent. Let's say Google's car. Google car patent. I think that'd be interesting to see. All right. Um, hmm. Okay. So this is called an access control for rental car. So some sort of a software patent. Uh, let me see. Huh. Yeah. Projector is hard to read. Can't read anything on the screen. 
Yeah, I think the projector is projector is back. Uh, let's yeah. see. Uh, okay, you can zoom in. Uh, let's see, control. Oh. Well, hey, uh, well, th I guess this is still in in uh, in there. Let me download it uh, and then open them up. Uh, it might not be a, uh, in the. Um, Oh. Okay. Well, at least it's it's, it's somewhat readable. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a an example patent on what they call. I guess you can't read it, but it says access control for rental car. So it's kind of a software. It's tied to a hardware, a rental car. So in that context, it's not just pure algorithm, right? And you notice here there's an abstract section, so it's hard to read, but we'll, we'll just kind of, you know, look at it. So they typically have a flow chart, uh, and so you can see the outline of a flow chart, but maybe as we scroll down, you'll see it better. Okay, so, all right, so you see here, you see how they describe at the top level uh, the architecture, you got a car, you got a server, you got a bunch of kiosks, you got smart cards that then allow you to, uh, to rent, I guess, to have access into the car. You pay for it and you have access into the car. Right? That's, uh, that's, so, and then after that, you got a series of flowcharts that explain how your system software operates uh, to enable this car rental mechanism. Right? Um, and so it's a series of flowcharts. Uh, and then here they talk about, uh, this is some more hardware. You see here, you got a door and an engine, and uh, you got actuators so that you can allow the car to be used. Uh, and then you have access control, which is your payment mechanism. Once you pay, then you can have actually you open, unlock the car and use it, right? Uh, and here is some more flow chart. So you can see that it's very much in, in, the, in the world of we live in, it's very much flow chart and then how it controls some sort of a hardware mechanism, okay? So that's that. Uh, let me quickly try to find a, an Uber pattern. Let's see if we can, um, uh, can, uh, can look up an Uber pattern. Search. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is a recent Ubo pattern here that we're going to try to see. Okay, uh, so let's see if we can zoom this thing in. Okay, so this is an, yeah, an example of an Uber pen. All right, so this is, uh, you can see the, the, the logo of Uber here. Ah, can anybody guess why they would have patented just a logo? Why would they just have patent this? Uh, why, why do you see only this, this, this screen here of a phone? And then the word you would. Why, why, would, why would somebody try that? It's an app. It's an app, right. And that's a user interface with the app. 
So you can see that it's a pretty rich material you can protect. Um, I have architected the Invisalign patent portfolio. And uh, if you're familiar with Invisalign, they, they have a very fancy process for making these uh, retainers, computerized fabricated retainers for you, right? So how many of you here have actually heard of Invisalign? Because how many of you are, are, are users of it? My friend. You know, actually, because you know why? The uh, below, if you're a teenager, there is um, there is some controversy as to whether or not that thing is actually good for people that are young. So they restricted it generally for the, to the older people. But yeah, uh, so uh, in the Invisalign system, what they do is they take a scan of the teeth, then they, like in animation, they try to morph your teeth so that it will move from you know a misaligned into an aligned state like this, right? And each stage along the way, you wear a retainer to move to provide pressure for you, right? So one of the most valuable patents that they have uh, is simply just the, it, it, the claim on that is simple: this three retainers that are computer fabricated within this year of sequence on each of them. And do you know why that's particularly valuable and important, even though it's so kind of you know so high level, so abstract? Yeah? Anybody can guess? Nope. Okay. The retainers have to be worn in a particular sequence, right? You have number one, number two, number three, number four, through up to a hundred, something like that, right? If you wear the retainer in correct in, in the wrong order, you're going to really mess up your, your treatment. So the claim of having a bunch of these retainers that are sequentially numbered, it will turn out to be the thing that block out all the competitors from entering the space. So something that simple. So my point on there is, you know, don't go and focus in on the high technology of all these 3D. Uh, they were aligned with one of the very first large volumes 3D printing.